Previously, we successfully gained foothold to Castle Black by exploiting an unrestricted file upload vulnerability. In this video, we will continue our attack by finding privilege escalation vectors to gain full control on the machine. Let's quickly check if Castle Black is still alive. Okay, that looks fine. Now let's connect to it using our exploit script. If you want to know how this exploit was created, I recommend you to watch the Exploit Development 101 video above. We are in. Whenever I get a shell inside a box, the first thing I check is the current user permissions. This is one of the low hanging fruits you should always check before anything else. One of the most common misconfigurations is giving a user more permissions that it need. A good example is this one. There are a lot of token-related permissions that this user doesn't even need as it only used to handle web-related tasks. An access token contains the identity and privilege associated with a process or thread. If we will be able to get a copy of another user's token and use that to gain higher privilege to the system, then that is called token impersonation. SE impersonate privilege allows impersonation of most tokens. Do note that although this allows you to impersonate a token, this doesn't allow you to create one. Print Spoofer is a common tool to exploit this misconfiguration, so let's find it in GitHub. My burp certificate is messing up my internet access because my browser is still hooked up to it, so I will temporarily disable it. Let's visit the first page result. If you see the .sln file, that means this is a Visual Studio project. You can download this on a Windows machine and compile it yourself. We see instructions here on how to use it, which can help us later. If you don't want to compile it, typically authors releases a pre-compiled binary, which can be seen on the releases page. I already have a copy of this binary on my Kali, so let's get back to the terminal. When preparing for OSCP, I made sure I have a copy of the common tools I might need to use like this one. So let's go to that directory. I have different copies suited for each architecture. Let's check the architecture version of Castle Black. You can use this handy environment variable to check whether you are on 64 32-bit operating system. Oops, sorry. I forgot to mention that this can be accessed under a PowerShell session. So let's create one and rerun again the command. It returned true meaning we are under a 64-bit OS. Just for demonstration purposes, if we were to do a check for 32-bit, then it should return nothing. You can also do similar thing to check on what architectures your reverse shell processor exploit is running on. There is also ways to check the system pointer size, but I'm not sure how reliable is that. Going back to print spoofer, let's pick the 64-bit version since we are on 64-bit OS. The spool driver's color folder is a good way to start since it's whitelisted by default for app locker. I will open an SMB share on my Kali. You can use any method you want, but I find impact at the easiest and one of the most reliable. Let me confirm my IP. And let's access it from Castle Black. Okay, we are connected. Let's copy print spoofer. Now let's go back to the GitHub page to see how we can use this. It says we can spawn command prompt as system on session one using this format. So let's try this. I'm guessing we are on session one. Oops, wrong format. Ah, it should be dash C. Okay, that seems to work. But we are still on the same user. Let's try the interactive format. And that's it. We are now running as NT Authority System. Let's go. Too easy, dude. Give me that crown. Hold on, my friend. OSCP is not this easy. <laughs> Sit tight, and I will tell you more tips so you can increase your chances of passing. Do note that the Active Directory set consists of machines that have dependencies with each other. So once you pawn a box, be sure to do post-exploitation such as finding user credentials and interesting files. Going back to our shell session, let's try to find something useful. Whenever I get a system shell, first place I always visit are the user folders. Here we can immediately see Rob Stark, which looks like a domain user based from the format. If you see a domain user folder here, there is a high chance that the user logged onto the machine. So try to enumerate it as much as possible as it may give you clues on how to access the domain controller. 
I have a handy command that I always use to find interesting files on a folder. dir displays list of files and subdirectories on the current folder. Dash A displays all kind of files, including hidden and system files. Dash B simplifies the output, removing unwanted distraction. Dash S looks for files recursively. Then I pipe it to find str to remove further noise. These are the common folders that doesn't really have value as they are created by default. Sorry, I forgot I am already inside a PowerShell session. Let's prepend cmd slash c to execute native Windows commands. Okay, let's slowly look at the output. Nothing interesting on the send to folder. These are the destinations when sending something to other places such as desktop, another folder, or email recipient. This can give clues on locations the user accessed recently. Same thing with links, where you can see the shortcuts pinned to the favorites in older Windows versions. Of course, the My Documents folder, which everyone already knows, we should check it as well. But nothing interesting here either. Downloads and desktop also should be one of the top things to check. Don't worry about the DAT files. These are system generated and contains user customizations. I don't think this is relevant and most likely you won't be able to open it. Let's do same thing with other user folders. Nothing interesting, so let's move on to other things to enumerate. Let's try to check the local users to make sure we didn't miss anything. Okay, we are good. There are no other local user other than administrator and vagrant. There is a possibility that some user folder was intentionally deleted or moved to other location. That's why it's good to verify this. Next thing we need to check is the domain users. I know this error. This might probably mean Castle Black is not using NetBIOS over TCP. But we don't have time to troubleshoot, so let's skip for now. Let's see if we can crack the admin password. Once we got it, we can use it to log into RDP or WinRM and retry the domain user enumeration. I'll prepare a loot directory. I'll monitor the file sizes to watch for corrupted transfers. I'll extract the SAM and system file from the Hive registry. Hives are set of registry values that are loaded in memory when the Windows start or user logs in. Okay, let's go back to the loot directory. Let's extract the content using impact. Local means local hashes. Actually, let's put it on a file. Let's double check in Hashcat if NTLM is mode 1000. Searching, not this. There you go. Let's fire up. Let's wait for a bit. If this takes more than five minutes, I will cancel it and try other methods. Okay, we got one. That's easy. And it's exhausted. That means it wasn't able to crack the admin password. Sorry if that section is exhausting. It is crucial that you think and act fast during the exam. Now let's slow down a bit. One quick tip, you can use CrackStation as an alternative to crack an NTLM hash. Let's get the NT part of the hashes. You can paste multiple values here. For testing purposes, let's get also the Vagrant NT hash. And there you go. It's a quick way to crack a hash, especially if you don't have enough computing power. You could also paste the LM hash, but in most cases you might encounter an empty value. It's because it's an old form of storing password and no longer advisable to use on modern Windows versions. Now, since we are not successful in cracking the admin password, Let's try to change it and let's log into RDP. I'm using X-Free RDP, but you can use our desktop as an alternative. Let's wait for that to load. Let's open PowerShell. Then let's check again the domain users and still fails. In the exam, you don't want to spend too much time in troubleshooting. If you still encounter issues like this, look for other ways. So let's try using WinRM. I'm using Evil WinRM, which is one of the most common way to log in from a Linux machine. And checking now again the domain users. This time we are successful. Since we can now see the domain users, let's try to find some juicy information. Let's try first to check if there are hard-coded passwords on the user description. This is a typical mistake by system administrators assuming that those fields are hidden from others. We only have few users on the list, so I will just use net user command to check. Okay, we got one for Samuel Tarley. You see, this is the reason why it is important to do post-exploitation. Since we now have a domain user credential, there are two things we can do at this point. We can either log into Castle Black as Samuel Tarley and enumerate the machine or use that credentials to do Bloodhound enumeration. We didn't really see a user home folder for Samuel, which means there is a less chance that he logs onto the machine, so we might not be able to find relevant information for him inside. That means Bloodhound enumeration is a better path at this point. Bloodhound is a tool that visualizes the relationship between different Active Directory objects. This can reveal misconfigurations and attack paths to domain admin. Bloodhound works by collecting domain information and putting that into a database for analysis. Let's collect the domain information from Kali using Bloodhound Python. The results will be a bunch of JSON files. Let's start the Neo4j and start the Bloodhound application. Default credentials is Neo4j, Neo4j. Let's upload the JSON files. Wait for it. 
and check all domain admins. There are only two domain admins, which is Eddard Stark and the global administrator. Another thing I always check is if there is a direct path from my current user to domain admins. We can do that here. Just provide the source and target node. Let's try first Eddard as our target node, nothing. Let's try now global admin. Nothing also, that's fine. Let's try other queries like looking for domain trusts. Let's right click on the edge and check further information. It says seven kingdoms.local is trusted by our current domain, but no attacks exist. So let's just keep this in mind for later, which may be useful. Let's see if we can find some Kerberostable users, which is another common query. Looks like nothing also. Let's move on. Let's go to shortest paths. Let's check first shortest path to domain admins. We got a hit. Oh, this is still Eddard Stark and Global Administrator. How about shortest path to high value targets? Okay, we got one, which is expected. We can see several users that are admin to Winterfell server, which we haven't pawned yet. There is also this SID with no username, which looks odd. Let's not bother for now, but keep in mind for later. To make sure we don't miss anything in the context of Samwell Tarly, let's inspect its node properties. Can't see anything useful so far. Let's check his group membership. He is a member of Nightwatch. That group has three direct members, including him. But there is nothing really interesting so far. Let's summarize what we got. We gain foothold to Castle Black via unrestricted file upload vulnerability. Then we perform token impersonation using print spoofer to get local admin access. On our post exploitation, we were able to get Samuel Tarley's domain credentials. Using his credentials, we were able to find out that Eddard Stark is a domain admin. There is also a SID with no username and a Nightwatch group, which we haven't explored fully yet. Lastly, we also found out that there is a trust relationship exists between North and its parent domain. And there you go, we fully conquered Castle Black. Thank you for joining me until the end of this video. Next part will be attacking Winterfell, which is the domain controller in North Seven Kingdoms.local. See you on the next one.